So the question is about optimization of fertility. <clears throat> this actually has an awful lot in common with optimization of general health. Because, of course, a man's fertility is a mirror of his general health. Recently, we have been able to be, I think, a little bit more precise, a little bit more definite in our advice to patients. And this is because, until relatively recently, we only had sperm counts as a rather crude measure of a man's fertility. And the difficulty with sperm counts is that they are extremely variable, uh, even within an individual. There may be 100% or more variation month to month. Um, things affect the sperm count transiently. If a man has had a fever, if he's run a marathon and got exhausted, then a month or two months later, his sperm count may be very different from one taken six months previously. And so it's always been very difficult to track men's fertility just by looking at sperm counts. But more recently, we've been able to look at the DNA quality of sperm. This is known as the DNA fragmentation test. There are lots of different forms of this test. And because they're different forms and because they're quite expensive, and because the protagonists of each of these tests does tend to state that their test is best, then the DNA fragmentation test has not come into universal use yet. But it is being used increasingly by fertility units to explain unexplained infertility. Now, since we've had this test, of course, we can measure more accurately the effects of lifestyle, particularly on sperm quality. And it is in this way that we can now be quite clear about the sorts of things that will damage fertility, not just by altering the sperm count, but actually by reducing the quality of the DNA within the sperm. Top of the list, of course, top of everybody's list in public health and in healthcare is smoking. This has a very marked effect on the quality of the DNA in the sperm, just as it has a marked effect on the quality of DNA elsewhere in the body. Then we've got to look at things that we take. We'll come to things that we eat shortly, but things that we take, and inadvertently often, uh, we might be taking uh, drugs in low doses, to restore, in men's cases, hair growth. Now, these drugs have a specific hormonal effect. They're acting hormonally on the hair follicles, which is why they work. But these are quite powerful hormonal disrupting drugs and can have a profound effect on semen volume, on spermatogenesis, and therefore on male fertility. Now, at the same time, and on the same theme, perhaps, dare I say, of a little vanity stimulated by the tabloids, the images, um, the pictures of the perfect male body, at the same time as taking substances to combat hair loss, we may be using steroids, and these steroids may be hidden, hidden in protein shakes that are available in gymnasia. And, of course, if there are steroids in these uh, substances, in these uh, protein shakes, or indeed if we take steroids as a separate issue, they work. They do make men make more muscle bulk, make, men, make it much easier for men to lose weight and to have a fine physique. And sometimes these substances can be addictive. Addictive for two reasons. The first is that because without the substances, then the body doesn't look so good and there is weight gain. But also without these substances, particularly testosterone derivatives, the men who have become used to high levels of exogenous testosterone actually feel quite ill. They feel tired. They lack motivation. They lack sexual drive. So once a man has started on a course of steroid abuse, it is actually extremely difficult to stop it. And these drugs have, despite suggestions to the contrary, 
these drugs do have profound effects on male fertility. And these profound effects often cannot be reversed, as is alleged, often by the people who sell these drugs, by other drugs to stimulate sperm production. So I think my number two, after smoking, would be steroid abuse and the use of other drugs, uh, for example, to restore hair, hair growth. But if we come on to what we eat, well then, this is a big topic. Because, of course, if you look uh, in the Western world at a graph that charts male obesity with male fertility, the decline in male fertility, then the increase in male obesity is absolutely parallel to the decrease in male fertility. Now, there are many reasons for this. One, of course, is the fact that the man is obese because this has hormonal disrupting effects because the sort of weight that we put on as we become obese, which is known as visceral fat uh, around the abdomen and increasing the waist circumference, this fat is actually metabolically active in terms of reducing the levels of testosterone. So there is a direct hormonal effect of being obese. But at the same time, we've got to think about how we got obese and what we ate in order to become obese. And of course, these will be sugary and salty substances, but also uh, processed foods which have chemical disruptors in them, which at the same time will be reducing spermatogenesis. Now, the state of being obese is also a state of oxidation. It causes oxidative stress. And we've now learned that oxidative stress within the fluid that we ejaculate, within our genital tract, can cause similar DNA damage to sperm. And so there are three ways in which obesity is actually uh, causing a reduction overall in male fertility, reducing sperm numbers and reducing sperm quality by a combination of hormonal and chemical disruption. Thank you.